So after the release of Metal Gear Solid, it was widely regarded as one of the greatest games ever made by fans and critics alike. And shortly after this, a little company you may have heard of called Nintendo was looking for some more mature titles to bring to their new system, the GameCube. So alongside going to Capcom and striking up a deal for a couple Resident Evil games, Nintendo also went to Konami and struck a deal for a Metal Gear Solid game. But rather than delay Metal Gear Solid 2, which was already well into production for the PlayStation 2, Konami decided that they would instead contract Canadian developer Silicon Knights to remake the original Metal Gear Solid for the GameCube. And this remake would end up going down as one of the most controversial video games of all time and has been regarded as one of the worst games in the franchise by fans for years. So, is Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes really that bad, or is it simply an overreaction from fans of the original? Well, let's talk about it. And before getting too far into the video, I should mention that this is the seventh in a series of videos where I'm playing every Metal Gear game for the first time and reviewing them as I go along in preparation for Metal Gear Delta. And while you don't have to have seen the rest of the videos in order to enjoy this one, you will be missing a lot of important context about my journey with those games if you haven't seen them, so I'll have the full playlist linked in the description below for those of you that want to go check those out first. But with that out of the way, Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes is a remake of Metal Gear Solid developed by Silicon Knights and published by Konami for the GameCube in 2004. And right off the bat, since this game is a remake, the format for this video is going to be a little different to what we've been doing for the rest of the games. Rather than recapping the game's plot alongside telling my own story and experiences with the game, I'm instead going to simply be talking about what the Twin Snakes does differently from the original, as doing this video in the normal format would end up with me basically just making a clone of the Metal Gear Solid video. So even though I always say that you don't have to have seen my other videos, for the sake of this one, I'm going to be assuming that you've either played the original game yourself, or have at least seen my video or some other in-depth look at it. So getting straight into it, the first thing to establish here is that The Twin Snakes is a very faithful remake. And before I get the angry comments from saying that, I'm not saying that every single piece of the original is unchanged and exactly as it was in the PS1 version, but I'm saying that in terms of the game overall, it is mostly faithful to the original. The game's story, setting, core gameplay, and level design are all present here, with slight changes being made throughout that we'll be digging into and looking at closely throughout the video. The term Faithful Remake is used in the gaming industry to describe a remake that while it changes some things, maintains the majority of the original's vision, and in The Twin Snakes, I would say that a solid 80% or so of the overall experience feels almost exactly the same as the original. That other 20% is where things actually end up getting pretty interesting with this remake and makes up the majority of what we'll be talking about throughout the video. And for comparison's sake, a less faithful remake would be something like comparing the original Resident Evil 2 on PS1 to its 2019 counterpart, where things like core gameplay, the story, and even the camera perspective were completely gutted and remade from the ground up by a new team of designers. But getting into the remake itself, the part of the game that's probably been altered the least is the script and the story. The overall plot of Metal Gear Solid is completely unchanged here, though fans of the original might notice that some lines of dialogue are worded slightly differently, but it's nothing to worry about as the overall meaning of everything is exactly the same here. Where the story differs a bit more in this game is in the cutscene direction and the overall presentation. The cutscenes in this game were completely redone by Silicon Knights, and from what I understand, these are one of the largest points of contention among Metal Gear fans. Seeing the characters of Metal Gear Solid in higher fidelity, acting out these scenes in a remake with improved visuals is great, but there are definitely some issues. Firstly, the characters' faces are all sorts of uncanny valley. The facial animations are incredibly stiff, seemingly from a lack of points of articulation, and the expressions that the characters in this game make during the cutscenes can be incredibly distracting. Another nitpick of mine coming from playing the game nowadays is the obnoxious motion blur in these scenes. The cinematics in this game use a lot of slow motion throughout the entirety of the experience, and while I'm sure these effects looked a lot better when viewed at 480p on a CRT screen, when viewing the game nowadays on HD screens, you'll notice pretty quickly that this blur effect was achieved by adding in intentional ghosting that those lower resolutions and tube TVs would have smoothed out to an actual blur. 
It's not really the game's fault, as this was a GameCube exclusive and thus was never meant to be played on anything other than actual hardware, but man is it annoying when recording footage in HD like I did for this video. And as far as I can tell, the most universally hated part of the new cutscenes is the Matrix-esque action that's been added into them. Now, to be completely fair to Silicon Knights, there was a small amount of this present in the original release of the game, but it's much more prevalent here in the remake. The action has been cranked up to the point of absurdity in many places, and while it does definitely get away from the more grounded feel of the original, I have to be honest, I thought that they could be pretty fun at times. And sure, some of them were just straight up stupid and impossible to suspend my disbelief for, but some of these scenes are genuinely well choreographed and felt like I was watching a scene straight out of Devil May Cry or something. On top of that, there are some bits of humor added into the game that weren't there before, and again, while some are completely ridiculous, I don't think that all of these are irredeemably bad or anything. Watch! My hand! And since we're still just talking about presentation, the visuals are, of course, an upgrade from the original in terms of fidelity. The GameCube was a powerhouse of its time, technically speaking, and the overall picture here looks pretty damn good. I don't completely agree with some of the artistic changes that have been made, such as dulling the colors in some areas to make them feel more believable and less video gamey, but it's impossible to argue that the graphical fidelity here isn't higher. I just think that the original game had a better overall look, though I do have to acknowledge that since I grew up with a PS1 and I have a lot of nostalgia with it from my childhood, I do tend to think that these games look better than they actually do. Something that surprised me though is that instead of using 3D character models for the codec calls like MGS2 did, they instead opted to reuse the codec artwork from the original release. I have no idea why this decision was made, unless the team at Silicon Knights just really loved Yoji Shinkawa's work, and I don't necessarily think it's a bad decision or anything, but I can't help but imagine what the game could have looked like if we had gotten hours of close-up footage of these faces. But getting into the gameplay itself, the first surprise came not just when seeing lockers present in the opening docks area, but when opening the first locker to find the M9 tranquilizer pistol from MGS2 inside. This thing is given to you right at the beginning of the game, and it proceeds to completely eviscerate the balance of Metal Gear Solid as soon as it appears. In the original game, the only way to silently take out a guard without them respawning was by snapping their necks, which required you to get right up against them, making it kind of tricky. But now, you can immediately and silently knock out guards from a distance, making the game a great deal easier. And while we're on the topic, other new mechanics like radios, dragging bodies, hiding in lockers, etc. have all returned from MGS2. These are all great things to have, and I really do believe that the stealth mechanics of MGS2 are better than those of MGS1, but they only worked so well thanks to the more challenging level design and improved AI of that game. Placing them into Metal Gear Solid's levels and encounters causes a lot of balancing problems, although it's not as bad as some other analysis videos here on YouTube make it out to be. Some areas in this game have had more guards added to them to balance out the new mechanics and additions, such as the canyon area now having three guards patrolling it alongside the normal cameras that were there before, and Metal Gear Rex's hangar having notably more guards than in the original game as well. I've heard a lot of people say that absolutely nothing was done in this game to balance the addition of these new mechanics, and while I would certainly agree that more should have been done and that the team didn't go far enough, saying that nothing was done is misinformed at best and completely disingenuous at worst. But back to some presentation stuff, one really odd thing about this game is that some of the characters have had their accents changed, with the most notable of the cast being Mei Ling and Dr. Naomi Hunter. Rather than having their Chinese and British accents respectively, they, for some reason, now have American accents in the remake. Nice to meet you, Snake. It's an honor to speak to a living legend like yourself. Well, if you make it back in one piece, maybe I'll let you do a strip search on me. What makes this especially weird is that in the Twin Snakes, the entire cast of the original game has returned to re-record the entire script, so the voice actors for these characters are the exact same, but have just been directed to change their accents for some reason. There is one character in the game who has a different actor though, that being Grey Fox. 
In the original game, Greg Eagles voiced both Gray Fox and the DARPA chief, but in the remake, he only reprises his role as the DARPA chief, with Rob Paulson being brought in to do the voice of Gray Fox. I couldn't find anything regarding why Paulson was brought in as the new voice for him, but I would assume that it was just done so that they didn't have to have one actor playing multiple roles again, as once you know that it's the same person, you can hear the similarities pretty easily. Back to the gameplay though, the game uses a similar system to the pressure sensitive buttons of MGS2, but since the GameCube controllers didn't have that functionality, it's not quite as smoothly executed here. Once you've aimed your gun by pressing the fire button, instead of lowering your gun by simply slowly releasing the button, you instead need to hold another face button which acts as the safety, before releasing the fire button and then the safety button in that order. The weapon lowering mechanic obviously needed to be brought back in some way to prevent your gun from always firing after you aim, but it's really noticeable how poorly executed it is after you've already played MGS2, and honestly, I feel like it could have been more natural if they had let you use a trigger or a shoulder button as the safety rather than another face button. The inventory tabs from MGS2 return as well, which is a very welcome addition. Metal Gear Solid's inventory organization wasn't awful, but it definitely could have been smoother than it was, and separating the items and weapons into categories like this just helps a lot with the sheer amount of items in this game. And in the very first room of the Shadow Moses facility, the designers show players that things will be a little different than how they remember. The overall layout of the tank hangar is exactly the same, but they've made it so that the guards will hear you running around on the catwalk, causing them to run up the stairs to investigate, pushing players into using the ledge hanging mechanic from MGS2 to avoid detection. There are a lot of moments like this throughout the game where even though the layout is the same as in the original, things have been altered just a tiny bit in order to change how you engage with these environments, and it's actually really neat. One major mistake of this remake though is the removal of leveling up. This was clearly done, again, to bring the remake more in line with Metal Gear Solid 2, but man was this a bad idea. In the original Metal Gear Solid, the game is balanced around the idea of you having a certain maximum number of things like ammo or healing items, or even maximum health itself for certain encounters and boss fights. But now in the remake, you have the end game health bar as soon as you start up the game, you can farm up to 5 rations right off the bat, and you can carry the maximum amount of ammo for any weapon that you find as soon as you find it. This is just another factor that contributes to the remake's balancing problems, and in my opinion, one of the more severe ones. And speaking of severe balancing issues, there's the first boss of the game, Revolver Ocelot. In the original game, you had to chase Ocelot around the room and find the right moments to stop and shoot at him in order to land some damage, and if you shot across the middle of the room, you would most likely hit President Baker and set off the explosives. But here in the Twin Snakes, thanks to the first person aiming mechanic, you can see Ocelot from anywhere in the room and carefully aim and fire at him without worrying about hitting Baker in the middle. It's one of the strongest examples from this game of how placing MGS2's mechanics into this game completely disrupts the balance, and while you can still play it like the original and have a blast with it, the fact that it's so easy to simply cheese the fight is still a big issue. But at the very least, when Gray Fox showed up at the end of that fight, it made me realize that some characters would benefit greatly from the more exaggerated cutscene direction, and he is absolutely one of them. Whenever Gray Fox shows up in the remake, he absolutely steals the show, doing some of the most badass shit I've seen in a game in a while. And you would kind of assume as much when we talk about putting a cyborg ninja into a game with extreme action scenes, but that doesn't take away from the fact that he is way cooler in the remake than he ever was in the original. Remember that hallway before you fight with him where you find all the dead bodies? Well now you actually get to see him killing those guards, and god is it cool.
And some of the more hardcore fans might have noticed that in that clip, there's a song that was never present in the original playing in the background. This is because the soundtrack was completely redone for the remake. And while this new score isn't bad in my opinion, it's not as good as the original either. The original game's music was always at the forefront of the experience, but here in the remake, they've gone for a more ambient sound and let it just kind of hang out in the background. The remake's soundtrack isn't bad by any means, and there are genuinely a couple tracks here that I really like, but it definitely felt like a downgrade to me. Here, take a listen and see what you think. But getting back to boss fights, it's important to mention that not all of them are hurt by MGS2's mechanics like the Ocelot fight is. In fact, the tank fight has been made much more dynamic here than it ever was in the original. Along with being able to shoot at the tank gunners with first person aiming, the designers have also added a small trench into the middle of the canyon, allowing you to duck down there and take a moment to heal and regroup whenever you need to. The tank gunners have also had their health roughly doubled compared to the original, meaning that you have to survive the fight for longer, increasing the difficulty even more, albeit artificially. The Psycho Mantis fight also benefits from the new additions. One of the biggest things here is the addition of the tranquilizer gun making it way easier to knock Meryl out when he's controlling her, which some might see as a downgrade, but honestly, I see as a good thing. Needing to knock Meryl out in the middle of this fight always felt like more of a temporary distraction than anything else, so being able to knock her out more quickly with a well-placed tranquilizer shot not only rewards skilled gameplay, but also helps the pace of the fight a lot in my opinion. On top of that, the designers also took advantage of the GameCube's extra controller ports, having Mantis more regularly read your mind and requiring you to switch between all four of the GameCube's ports by the end of the fight, adding a little more dynamism to the encounter. Other than these examples though, bosses have been mostly unchanged. Almost every boss is now able to be defeated non-lethally by using tranquilizer rounds, which does lead to a very weird disconnect when you defeat them with tranks but then they're filled with bullet holes and dying in the cutscenes, but outside of that and the listed examples, the bosses are relatively untouched. So as one last note on the bosses, I would like to mention that some cute little details have been changed in the room you fight Grey Fox in, with the PlayStation on the desk being replaced by a GameCube, and some of Otacon's figurines being replaced with Mario and Yoshi figures. And similar to Meryl during the Psycho Mantis fight, the addition of the tranquilizer gun also makes the dogs in the cave section much less annoying. Especially since MGS2 added the ability to fire your weapon while crawling, you can simply fire off a single trank round at one of the dogs as you enter the cave to just put them to sleep and run through the cave more easily. Again, some fans of the original might see this as a downgrade, but I always thought that the wolves down here were really obnoxious, so this was actually a very welcome change for me. And speaking of tranquilizers making things more convenient, the addition of the PSG-1T, the non-lethal sniper rifle, has made it so that the sniper wolf fight requires much less backtracking than before. In the original, you had to go all the way back to the first building's arsenal to grab the PSG-1, but with the tranquilizer variant being added to the game, they placed it in one of the offices in the nuclear storage building, cutting out a good 5 minutes or so of the backtracking from this part of the game. And since you go back to the first building after the Sniper Wolf fight anyway for story reasons, you can simply grab the regular PSG-1 then, meaning that you save time and you get to have both Sniper variants anyway. And while there were barely any changes to the story of the game, there are a couple interesting ones that I want to point out here. The first one was the addition of actual wolves being present during Sniper Wolf's death scene. It's a small thing, but having the dogs that she took care of on the island gather around and sit there while she's bleeding out just made the scene a little extra sad compared to the original. And another one that I liked near the end of the game was when Snake drops the PAL key into the drainage ditch. This is more of a gameplay change than a story change if anything, but when you go down to look for it, Master Miller will call saying that if it's not there, a rat must have eaten it, and players will then need to go find and kill a rat that moves around the hangar in order to get it back. 
It's not a major change by any means, but it does go a long way to make this task a little more interesting, as in the original, it's clearly just there to add a couple minutes to your runtime. And the biggest scene change comes from the final car chase at the end of the game, which, as a side note, is way more fun than before thanks to the first person aiming making things feel way more cinematic and tense than in the original. But after we crash, which we actually get to see on screen this time thanks to the improved hardware, instead of getting stuck under the car, Snake and Meryl stand there against Liquid when he comes back around to shoot Snake. And this change actively removes all of the tension from this scene as Snake suffered no injuries in the crash while Liquid is practically on death's door. And with all of the action that we've seen throughout the game, we know that it would be so easy for Snake to just grab the rifle out of his hands and be done with it. Liquid still gets killed by Fox Die at the end, but I wanted to point this out because it was a seriously baffling change that I just couldn't wrap my head around when I played. Overall, I feel mixed on the Twin Snakes. I definitely agree with the general opinion that it's a downgrade from the original, and I would never recommend that this be someone's first experience with Metal Gear Solid, but I still thought it was a pretty enjoyable experience on its own. It fails as a remake, but as a game, it's still pretty damn good, and ultimately, if this was someone's first experience with Metal Gear Solid, it wouldn't be the end of the world, as this is still a damn good game all things considered. It still has the original's amazing story, pacing, and setting, just with some downgraded gameplay and presentation. I do think that I'll revisit the Twin Snakes someday, as even with all of its problems, it is still really fun to play MGS1 with MGS2's mechanics, but I unfortunately can't say that it's as strong of an experience as the original game. So at the end of the day, I'm going to give Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes an 8.5. Hey guys, thanks for hanging out. If you'd like to support the channel a little extra, feel free to check out my Patreon, where if we hit our funding goal, I'll even do a bonus review for Death Stranding once we're done with this series. And of course, a huge shout out to the current channel members and patrons, you guys really do go a long way in helping the channel financially, and it really does make a lot of this possible. If you liked what you saw here, I'll have my other Metal Gear reviews linked on screen, as well as a similar series that we've been doing covering the Ace Combat games. But with all that being said, I'll hope to see all of you guys back here next time for the next Metal Gear review.